Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I love all these conversations everybody's having. Good to see some familiar faces. Um, my name is Kelly Longo, and I'm the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at the Public Policy Institute of California. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with PPIC, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit policy think tank with offices in San Francisco and Sacramento. Uh, for today's program, we're going to learn uh, the findings from the new PPIC report entitled Higher Education as a Driver of Economic Mobility, co-authored by Hans Johnson, Marisol, um, Marisol Cuellar Mejia, and Sarah Bone, and also Sergio over here provided research support, so I want to um, thank him for that. Uh, the research was supported with funding from the College Futures Foundation and the Sutton Family Fund, so we'd like to thank them. Um, and the PPIC corporate and donor circles, we'd like to um, thank them for making today's lunch possible. So that always gets people in the door. Um, the re and of course, the really good research. Um, the report, technical appendix, and slides from today's presentation are now available on our website at ppic.org. And uh, just a couple of quick things before we begin. For our final event of the year, we'll be over at Library and Courts for our last survey briefing this Friday, Californians and their government. And later today, you'll receive a, a short survey because for PPIC. And please take a few moments to let us know how we did. Uh, and of course, please silence your cell phones as we do record this. Um, now, I have the pleasure of introducing Sarah Bone. Uh, she's the Director of Research and a Senior Fellow at PPIC. Her research focuses on the role of the social safety net and education uh, policy in allevi alleviating poverty and enhancing economic mobility. Uh, and we'll have plenty of time for um, question and answer after this. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm here representing the team up front who did the hard work of this report, and we wanted to reiterate our appreciation for the funders of this work, College Futures Foundation and the Sutton Family Fund that really made it possible. We're so appreciative. In this work that we'll be talking about today, we really aimed to look at the economic benefits of college degrees and understand and assess where we're at in California in terms of meeting the, um, the need for more students to complete college degrees in California. So uh, California's economy is strong on many measures. Uh, looking at this chart, you see that unemployment is at about a 40-year low. We're also in the midst of the second longest job expansion on record. And our economy is not only the largest, um, of course, across states in the United States, but is also growing the fastest than almost all other states um, in the country. So seemingly, opportunity for economic advancement abounds today in California. So when P PPIC recently surveyed Californians about their views on higher education, the majority said that uh, a college degree is very important um, for economic success in today's society, and I'm glad to report that they are right. Um, economic success is really tied to educational attainment in, uh, in the modern economy. While jobs do abound in our state, succeeding economically is, is um, inextricably tied with your level of educational attainment. In California, the typical worker, full-time worker with a college degree, earns about $80,000 annually, compared to just $36,000 for high school graduates. Uh, that earnings advantage for college degree holders in our economy has grown since 1990. Uh, throughout the presentation today, I'll show you recent data that we've compiled in this report on other benefits to higher education um, across a number of realms. And despite that evidence, you'll see that too few Californians are earning college degrees. Uh, and in today's economy, I just wanted to reiterate, and also for the future economic success of, of, our, uh, of, of our state, it's critical for California to regain its position as a global leader in, in broadening access to college and improving success in college for, for the diverse group of young adults in California. And the, the rest of this presentation will uh, flow as follows. I'll start by showing some of our uh, results on the value of a college degree. 
and then highlight how California is falling short and not making enough progress in improving college completion. Throughout, I'm actually going to sprinkle in the good news, because this isn't all bad news, even though I am a dismal scientist. I like to look for the optimistic um, things that we can build on. So I'll be highlighting some areas for um, to be proud of and, and progress that's been made. But in the end, we'll conclude by looking at what more needs to be done, what more can be done to improve college completion in California. Uh, in this report, we, we rely on data from a number of sources, um, including large-scale census survey data, um, reporting from the college uh, segments themselves, community college, UC, CSU, et cetera, and also related research from others um, that is pertinent to this topic. So please check the paper for full sources on, on the um, slides that I'll be showing you today for those data wonks in the, in the room. <laughs> So uh, I showed you a little bit earlier the kind of earnings advantage that we see for, um, for workers with a college degree. In this chart, we're kind of looking at the same story, but uh, a little bit differently and a little bit more carefully. Um, so to ensure that we're not kind of just attributing the, the wage advantage to college degree holders to their age, their gender, uh, their race, ethnicity, their immigration status, we used statistical models to basically um, take that effect out and just look for similar individuals who have different levels of education. What is the wage advantage um, to that higher, um, higher level of education? And what you see in this chart is that compared to high school graduates, uh, workers with some college training, but not a degree in California, earn 21% more um, on average. Uh, those with an associate's degree earn 29% more than an otherwise demographically similar worker with just a high school diploma. And bachelor's degree holders is where we see that first really big bump. So bachelor's degree earners compared to otherwise similar um, high school graduates earn 62% more. Um, <clears throat> and I will note that the, uh, there are other factors, of course, that go into earnings levels. Um, the choice of your major, where you live, the occupation or, or industry that you're employed in matter um, for kind of the, the wage advantage that you might see. Um, but on average and consistently, we see the strong pattern um, that the higher level of education you have, the greater the economic return that you experience. Beyond earning higher wages, uh, more education correlates to higher odds of participating in the labor market, that's the left side chart, and to low, low, lower unemployment rates. In fact, uh, bachelor's degree holders or higher um, have less than half the unemployment rate of those um, with just a high school diploma. And not shown here, but provided in the report, are some other correlates of, of higher education, including non-wage benefits, like having employer-provided health insurance, having uh, retirement savings accounts, and that kind of thing. In addition, um, Cal PPIC's California Poverty Measure Research shows that education is strongly correlated with poverty and social safety net reliance. Um, so poverty among those families um, headed by someone with a bachelor's degree or more is nearly three times lower than for families headed by workers with just a high school diploma. This same research shows on the right-hand panel that the more education um, in, a, in a family unit, um, the lower the odds that they will be relying on social safety net benefits, things like food assistance through CalFresh, housing subsidies, and the like. So in sum, higher education is correlated with a host of benefits in today's society. And I would be remiss if I didn't know that there is some circularity to this relationship. The same factors that might make you prone to fall into poverty or be unemployed may be also related to barriers to earning a higher um, a college credential. And this report isn't about disentangling that or identifying causal effects of higher education, but rather to assess um, what access to this um, kind of ticket for a host of benefits, both economic and social in our society, um, where we're at in terms of that kind of access. Uh, to ensure that kind of access to college education and economic mobility is more broad-based. And that's really, in my mind, the crux of the kind of economic mobility puzzle is, and, and what we want to achieve is ensuring that your level of education um, post high school is not completely determined by the social uh, or economic circumstances of your birth. 
So next, where are we at in the state in terms of college attainment? Although college degrees, as we've shown, have big payoffs, um, most adults in California do not have a college education. Two thirds do not have a bachelor's degree or higher. In fact, California has lost its ground um, in, uh, in its uh, uh, educational attainment among its workforce. Um, in California, which is, it might be hard to read this bottom line for some of you, we're at the very right end of this chart, which is not a good thing. Um, in California, the share of adults, older adults, age 55 to 64, as compared to young adults, age 25 to 34, the, their, um, the percentage of those populations that have a college degree is roughly similar, just two percentage points different. That's why we're that lowest bar here. So we've kind of stayed pat, really, in terms of generational progress in college attainment. And in the world today, staying steady is actually to be falling behind. That's why we're at the right-hand side. You see the United States overall has made more progress generationally in college attainment than us. That's the second orange bar you see. The next orange bar you see is for the um, OECD or the uh, 29 country, I think it's 29 somewhere around there, <laughs> um, countries that are part of the OECD uh, developed nations, have, have they uh, on average have made a lot of progress in generations um, achieving higher levels of education. And this isn't just because they started at a much lower level than us, because you'll see countries like Switzerland, Denmark, Canada, all of which have kind of similar um, rates of college attainment among the older adults, but have made a lot more progress than we have in California. So it's not surprising then that generational progress in earnings has also declined over time. Um, children in California are less likely today to out-earn their parents than those um, born uh, generations ago. Uh, and this trend is actually consistent in the US also as well. So most children born in the 1940s, 89%, as adults out-earned their parents. And that uh, share fell over time to get us to the latest kind of cohort that we can examine, which is children born in the 80s, who are now young adults in the workforce. 49% of them are out earning their parents. And slowing educational progress is a key component um, behind this long-term trend. Today, there are 33% 33, 33 of young adults in California have a bachelor's degree or higher. But as you can see in these blue bars, um, there are very different college completion rates across um, a demographic background in this chart, particularly highlighting um, race and ethnicity. Half as many African American or Latino young adults in California have a college degree as compared to white Californians. But by 2030, some other research that we've done at PPIC suggests that we'll need at least 38% of our workforce um, to have a college degree or more just to meet workforce needs. And you should think of that as a minimum, 38%. Right now, we're at about 33%. The highest college completion rates are actually among the smallest population groups as well. So this demographic trend is exacerbating the problem um, of improving college completion. So Asian American young adults um, are just 8% of the population you see in this chart. They have the highest college achievement rate. Whites are the plurality, about 43% of the, po of the population among young adults. And Latinos are the next largest, 38%. So we really can't get to that 38% college completion rate in our state without ensuring that we have a broad-based um, improvement in college completion, especially um, among Latino students. And I wanted to mention here that um, in this, pic this report, we're looking at big picture, kind of big population group trends. Um, but it's important to understand that um, there are a lot of differences even within these categorizations. So for example, Pacific Islanders are included in Asian Americans. They tend to have slightly different trends than other Asian subgroups. And some uh, small population groups aren't included in this chart, um, like Native Americans, for example, just I think 0.4% of the, of the population of young adults, but nonetheless an important group to consider in terms of ensuring that economic mobility and the route to get there um, through college is also accessible to those even small population groups. So why if 
uh, college confers so many benefits, are we falling behind in college attainment? Um, we just saw that the odds of completing college vary a lot across student race and ethnicity. We refer to this as equity gaps. And similar gaps are observed for students depending on um, other socioeconomic uh, categorizations like coming from a low income family or being a first generation college student, which refers to <laughs> students whose parents did not go to college. Um, and we see that these kind of gaps across groups based on socioeconomic background really persist at kind of all levels, um, all stages in the pathway towards a college degree. And I'll show you in a few more slides to kind of walk through that a bit. So in California today, 75% of high school students are categorized as so either socioeconomically disadvantaged or in one of the historically underrepresented um, race ethnic subgroups. And so given these demographics, um, it's critical that we address um, achievement gaps um, in order to improve college statewide, college attainment. And we'll look, as I mentioned, more into these trends, dig into it a bit. Um, to step back and, and touch on this last bullet in terms of access. So four-year institute, access to four-year colleges, Cal State especially and UC um, in California has not kept up with increases in high school graduation and college readiness, um, which is another challenge to um, ensuring that more students eventually achieve a college degree in California. To look at that a little bit more closely, you see in this chart that 83%, that orange bar, of um, high schoolers in California um, earn a, 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 sorry, graduate from high school. Um, and this is actually noting, this is I guess my first um, positive note, um, improvement from 75% back in 2009. And a lot of that increase actually is coming from improvements in graduation among um, underrepresented groups like Latino high schoolers. But you can see that those um, disadvantaged groups still lag behind in graduation rates. So 80% of Latino high schoolers graduate, 79% of socioeconomically disadvantaged high schoolers graduate. Um, in addition, looking more closely at what makes you eligible for four-year institutions in California, not shown here but cited in the report, are the share of high schoolers that complete their A to G course requirements that make them eligible to apply for um, the University of California and Cal State. About 47% of high schoolers actually complete those agreements, those, uh, those requirements, a big improvement over time as well. Um, so while more high schoolers are eligible to apply for UC and CSU, these institutions regularly have to turn away thousands of qualified applicants. They simply don't have the slots. And in addition, the master plan for education um, from about 50 years ago, um, you know, set forth that the University of California was to select from the top 12 and percent of high school graduates, the CSU from the top 30 3% of high school graduates. Well, now we have 47% of high schoolers completing the um, eligibility requirements. Um, and the master plan hasn't been uh, uh, revised to account for this um, improvement in achievement at the high school level. So in the end, we see a lot more students being served by the open access community college system in California, where there's typically a much longer road to get to a bachelor's degree. Among recent high school graduates, we actually see um, uh, some good news. The majority across all income groups um, go to college, um, but it does the rates improve um, the higher kind of higher income background that you come from. So high schoolers from families at the lowest end that we're able to measure in this data, $30,000 or below, 67% go on to college. Um, and this steps up all the way to 88% at the top end. These rates in California are actually better than in the rest of the US. So there's another bit of good news to share. But you might, you might ask why if at least 67% of high schoolers are going to college, why do we only have a third achieving a college degree? So let's get into some of the, the facts and where we're at in, in, in that. So it starts with trying to understand um, what's happening in the different higher educational segments across California. And this chart shows, I think, pretty clearly that different segments are serving different sets of students and thus face different challenges. So in community colleges, CCC at the far right, far left, um, 
They serve um, the largest share of Latino students in California, 49%. The CSU is just a bit behind that. Um, and the UCUC is serving a, a, lot, a smaller share of, of historically underrepresented racial groups in California. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's worth noting that these first two segments, the community colleges and the CSU, also serve a larger number of uh, students by far compared to UC and private nonprofit colleges. Um, and they're most, refle most reflective of the young adult population demographics. So um, that's promising. Beyond racial ethnic background, if we look at economic and social background, of students, you see kind of similar trends um, where the majority of community college and CSU students are first generation college goers, um, and just under 50% come from low income backgrounds. Um, note, just for, I just want to note for a second that um, this low income category isn't perfectly aligned across the segments because of um, the data that is. Um, publicly available from the different segments. So there are some definitional differences here. Um, so don't take it too literally. Um, <laughs> um, but we see um, you know, similar trends across um, the institutions as, as to when you look at um, uh, race and ethnicity. Now, 60% of K-12 students are, um, uh, are, are uh, from socio socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. So even in the community colleges or CSU, we're still not really reflecting the, the full um, population. Um, I should say that low-income students are still underrepresented, even in the segments that are kind of reaching them the best. Um, another um, bright spot or note of progress here is that um, the enrollment of first-generation and low-income students at CSU and UC has improved substantially over the past decade. Um, and then also, uh, you see when you compare um, to uh, peer institutions in other states is doing much better in enrolling, especially first-generation and low-income students. So that's progress and, and good notes, but there's clearly a lot of room to improve in order to reach the three-quarters of high schoolers um, who, are in these dis who are in disadvantaged um, population groups. So access to college is the first step, but what we're really after is college completion. So here's the other point in the pathway where we um, face some challenges. Um, this chart shows you graduation rates across CSU, UC, and private nonprofits. And the first takeaway is that uh, graduation rates at UC are highest overall, followed by private nonprofit institutions and then the CSU. But all segments have equity gaps in terms of completion across race and ethnic <coughs> background. Um, with those gaps across groups, say comparing Latino graduation rates to white graduation rates is largest at the CSU. Um, though it has shrunk in recent years thanks to their graduation inif initiative and also other efforts to improve graduation um, over a long time period. So back in 1995, the overall CSU graduation rate um, was about 40%. It's about 60% now. So looking next at differences by income, you see kind of a similar pattern. Um, graduation rates overall are highest at the UC, followed by private nonprofits and then CSU. But you also see this persistent gap in graduation rates across income groups um, between low income and uh, students who are not from low income families. Now, the community college system hasn't been represented in this chart or the previous one because the focus of this report was really in that four-year college achievement. Um, but community college students who transfer are reflected um, in the data. And that's a really critical pathway for us to focus on um, uh, both in policy research and in policy making, um, because as you saw, the community colleges serve the, um, the most socioeconomically diverse set of students and actually the largest set of students um, it, across all higher education segments in California. So the, the ability to transfer from CSU to UC or, or um, CSU um, is critical, um, and this is an active area of work for the segments in coordinating um, and making that path transfer pathway um, from community college to um, earn a four-year degree in one of these institutions much more um, uh, uh, efficient. Um, and successful. Um, the, you may be familiar with the Associate's Degree for Transfer program that is doing a lot of that streamlining and includes now not just the CSU and UC, but also private nonprofits in aligning what, uh, what are, is required of students to transfer. 
So with these facts in hand, let me revisit some of the um, progress that we've made and discuss next steps that we recommend in the report. In terms of college preparation, I noted, hopefully I didn't forget, I think I actually noted this, <laughs> um, that more high school students are completing coursework um, to be UC or CSU eligible with especially large improvements uh, for Latinos. In terms of college access at UC and CSU, the share of first-time first freshmen who um, are from low-income backgrounds um, has gone up substantially compared to 10 years ago. And as I just uh, mentioned, um, transfer pathways from community colleges to four-year institutions are actively being streamlined, um, and there are some promising signs there. As well, I would highlight the uh, community college vision for success, which outlines ambitious goals uh, for the segment to um, improve transfer and success on many dimensions and to reduce um, gaps across uh, socioeconomic groups. In terms of student success, the CSU graduation initiative, um, as I mentioned, has been um, uh, arguably improving uh, graduation rates overall and closing some of these gaps in the last few years. And one important area that I haven't touched on yet is financial aid. Uh, Cal Grants, um, California's uh, assistance um, financial aid program, um, provides a large, uh, tuition assistance and larger tuition assistance for lower income families, lower income students, um, so that many low income students in the system uh, don't pay tuition at all. And that's targeted, I would argue, just right. Not that it's perfect, but <laughs> that's where you should be targeting financial aid if you're trying to improve um, college access and completion for low income students. So, you know, the, that's, um, that's, a lot of good progress has been made, but as we see in the data, there's need for further uh, work on this um, and uh, additional action. And in this chart, we uh, kind of outlined by the, the same five areas, additional steps that should be considered to try to improve college completion more broadly in California. In terms of college preparation, um, information um, for families um, and high schoolers or even middle schoolers is really critical, especially for the large share of California's young adults whose parents didn't go to college, who, uh, don't, uh, who need to be clear on um, what is required of them to be eligible for four-year institutions um, and their access to financial aid. In terms of college access, um, colleges could systematically consider these socioeconomic characteristics in improving, uh, in granting higher priority in admissions decisions. Although I would say that um, without also expanding the number of slots that they have, um, that um, would be unlikely to, to work so well. Uh, so those are kind of two recommendations we have around student access to college. Uh, in transfers, the work on associate's degree for transfer is promising and could include more colleges and more majors um, to broaden um, this path, important pathway from community college to four-year institutions. In terms of student success, something that we haven't talked about yet but we think um, is important is, to, is the role of student supports, advising, and other things that help students, especially maybe first-generation or low-income students, um, uh, have the support, um, the, the mentoring, and things that they need to be successful in college once they've accessed it. And you know, there, there's an opportunity to learn a lot from the CSU graduation initiative, which has shown promising results. Um, to, so we think that that should be rigorously um, analyzed in order to um, provide more guidance on, on what works. And then last, in terms of financial aid, although it is the case that low-income students often do not pay tuition, um, of course, going to college is more costly than just the tuition. And so fina future financial aid proposals that are in the works are already considering how to account for that total cost of college, not just the tuition piece, um, that might help more students successfully be able to um, access college in California. In summary, um, I, I would reiterate that uh, our California's higher education institutions 
actually have a track record um, of being a global leader in college and broadening college access and in improving um, college completion for, for a lot of Californians. And now is really the time for us to return to that position um, and to invest um, in strategies that work for broadening access and improving student results across um, the diverse set of young, young Californians um, in our economy today. Um, and with that, I will invite Hans Johnson to come up and we'll take questions. Um, I, our co-author Marisol is saving her voice right now, so we'll try not to ask you to answer any of them. Um, and if you'd like to uh, ask a question, please just wait a second for one of our staff with a microphone to come around so that everyone can hear and it can be reflected in the video. Jeff Tardigia, an advocate, got involved with disability higher education some time ago. Um, there was notice that private institute offered that institution. Have you offered any consideration of dealing with the changeover for English as a language for dealing with the high school graduation? Because that was something that changed. And also the period of time that you're covering through there to next will be the Proposition uh, 20 and 20, or Proposition 13, of whether there's any desire to see that that, that, that focus is for education purposes. So regarding English learners, that wasn't one of the big population groups that we focused on in this report, but is critical. Um, and we have some ongoing work that will be coming out in April on English learners and community colleges. Um, that's an active area of reform, along with other developmental education reforms, um, and something that we're tracking in ways that colleges are um, uh, uh, reforming their kind of course pathways that might work better for English learners. And on Prop 13, did you ask about Prop 13? That was just so we, it we, was an education focus previously, and they're now 2020, it's a ballot measure. So, so we, we had a, a, a question on our recent uh, higher education survey on whether Californians would support uh, a split, what, we, what most people in this room know as a split role. It was defined differently in the question because it went to the general public. Um, and it, uh, identified that a majority of Californians would be in favor of charging commercial properties differently than residential properties under Prop 13, assessing them differently, uh, if the revenue went to higher education. In the back? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Great presentation. I have a question. Have you done any correlations between uh, high school graduation rates and access to college with college readiness and remediation needs? Hmm. Well, so, 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 so there's a lot to unpack there. So certainly, <laughs> to be eligible for UC or CSU, you have to have completed the A through G course requirements, which we have identified here. They're in the report. Um, you can actually look up how those have changed over time. We have, we have data on that, too. Um, so there's good news in terms of high school graduation rates getting better, getting better for every group, especially for some uh, groups that have had lower graduation rates in the past. Uh, good news again, um, as Sarah already pointed out, on A through G um, preparation. There is, of course, when students make that transition from high school to college or from community college to four-year colleges, a lot of challenges that can come up, especially with respect to what's called developmental education or remedial education and the need to take uh, pre-collegiate courses in math and English, even once they arrive, most commonly this occurs at the community colleges and probably most of you in this room know, there have been huge changes in reforms in remedial education in California, AB 705, which was passed, was it last year or two years ago? Last year. Last year uh, will lead to almost certainly a huge increase in uh, students being placed directly into college level math and English courses in the community colleges. Many of those will have co-requisite courses to provide supports for students who might need additional help in the college level course. We've done some research that we presented here in Sacramento not long ago that showed that the early implementers of those co-requisite programs had some very remarkable improvements in the share of students that completed those college level math and English courses. So again, there's, I think, a lot of good news. 
And the big picture, at least from my perspective, is we just can, we continually to see, as, as Sarah pointed out, there's this question, well, why, why, given all the benefits of college, why don't we see a response? And one answer is, well, we do see a response. We see students completing the A through G courses. We see more students going to community colleges and trying to transfer. I think uh, there's some good news on student, the student progress side uh, on, in terms of accommodating those students and finding room for those students in our systems. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have going forward. Hi, I'm Karen Baker with California Volunteers with AmeriCorps. Um, struck by a couple things that, um, first of all, great report, great presentation. I um, am interested, and this is more as a parent that I'm speaking to this, um, even though my kids are not yet at the stage of applying for college, I hear the horror stories of the application process. And um, I say that because the, just the process of applying for college wasn't noted. Uh, there's access, but the application itself can be so daunting. And I just wondered if that's something that you considered studying or if that came up as an issue. And I, I'm, so I'm curious about that. And then I know in the case of AmeriCorps members, I, it would be interesting to me because of the mix, we've had 130,000 Californians that have served in AmeriCorps earning 400 million in education awards to pay for college, definitely representing primarily the underrepresented. It would be interesting to me to also look at kind of what are the, the college bound stats on that, but just wanted to really dive into the, especially the application challenge. I think we'll write that down and, and look into it. Do you want to comment on the joint, the CSU used application? Oh, so yeah, I mean, there are efforts and have been efforts to make that application process better um, and easier for students. There's also, there are also efforts to make sure that students are filling out their FAFSA or they get help filling out their FAFSA. There have been um, substantive changes in FAFSA that make it easier to fill out, but it is still the case that that college op uh, application process is, is um, really convoluted and has deadlines that you better meet or else you're not even in the pool of students that can be considered. So yeah, there's still challenges. Thank you. Um, Christopher Morales, Senate Fellow for Senator Bradford's office. Uh, I had a question in regards to your first uh, infographic relating to the median, uh, the median salary. Um, oh. In regards <laughs> to that, in regards to that graphic, you know, how did that graphic change? Did the research present how that graphic changed in regards to um, differences for underrepresented, upper underrepresented minority groups, as well as you know whether you went to a CSU or UC, was there any research that showed how that was kind of uh, changed? I say that like as a, as a Latino from a CSU, yeah. does that change you know, compared to someone who's a white student from a UC or a black student from a private nonprofit? How does that change necessarily? Yeah. Just come up and use the mic. Yeah. You know, we didn't make the report, but we calculated, um, sorry. Uh, they didn't make it to the report, but we did calculate like wage premiums by demographic groups. And we see for every single demographic group was a college wage premium relative to high school. But again, we see some um, gaps. And those gaps, again, as Sarah mentioned, might be related with the type of majors. So we don't know, so it will be interesting to study at some point if underrepresented students are usually uh, kind of like guided to, to less uh, remote, remote rem Monerative uh, majors. So I think that will be something that will be uh, interesting to study in terms of this. But basically, the short answer is we did that. We calculate wage premiums, but uh, subgroups, everybody has a, a experience a college wage premium, but there is differences across uh, groups, ethnic groups. Thanks, Mary. Can, can I add uh, If you want, we can, uh, you can email me and we can share that information. Yeah. And then figure A1 in the appendix, which I think, you, do you all have the appendices or you don't? No? Okay, sorry. And it's one of my favorite charts. <laughs> so you're gonna have to go online and look at our appendix. And it actually shows uh, the wage distribution depending on your major. And of course, at the top is engineering, second is computer science. The least remunerative major is education. 
Um, but even education majors, the vast majority of them make more than high school graduates. But of course, there are large differences. And there are also differences across institutions as well. Yeah, and if we had a longitudinal go. data system, <laughs> um, we could track a lot of that better. So the segments do provide some resources on kind of the earnings of their graduates, but in a um, in a really comprehensive, a representative way to look at the population, we actually, in this data, we can't know where you got your bachelor's degree from, so. <laughs> oh. Hey, thank you so much. Um, Wesley Whitaker from Assemblymember Irwin's office. Uh, so I had a question. We hear a lot about this shortage of degrees, but um, another shortage we're hearing about is in like skilled uh, labor and skilled trades. So I was wondering if your data also captured um, career technical education and you know, if people didn't go to college but did that instead or maybe did that on top of an associate's yeah. degree or something like that. Um, is, is that go back to the longitudinal, we don't have a way to track that? <laughs> or um, yeah, just what do you think uh, about that? Great question. Um, this is an area of my research that is also ongoing. In this report, we really were focused on the four-year degree in part because when you look at a lot of cuts of the data, the biggest returns really are for bachelor's degrees. Now, there are some exceptions. Registered nursing is a CTE credential that is um, exceeds actually a lot of the bachelor's degree um, average wages. Um, but to, to directly answer your question, the, um, those kind of certificates, vocational certificates, are rep represented in that green line um, that also includes people who went to college. They could have gone to UC, UCSU and just didn't complete. So it's a real mix. And in, the data, in this survey, large-scale survey data, we don't actually, we're not able to break it out. We would love to be able to do that. Um, but it is an ongoing research effort at PPIC to look more closely because of the, the skills gaps in that area um, that, you know, although we'll need 38% of, 38% uh, of our future workforce will need a bachelor's degree, that leaves actually the majority that won't. And identifying um, credentials and occupations that provide the best opportunities for middle income or higher um, uh, work is, I think, critical to ensuring that our investments in career education in California are really benefiting um, uh, our population as, as best they can. And, and stay tuned because your report is going to be out when? Your in report. June. There you go. Uh, in, and I can, I'd be happy to share with you what we've already done on CTE. So we have looked at kind of earnings, outcomes, and, and economic mobility in health professions um, at California's community colleges. And we're now kind of expanding that work more broadly. So thanks for that question. <laughs> Where are we? Oh, hi. hi. Susan Catron, I'm with UC Davis Continuing and Professional Ed. And I'm curious if, uh, thank you, great research. Um, I'm curious if you've looked at returning adult learners as a subpopulation and what kind of success rates they're having, what kind of challenges they're having. Seems like moving the needle there with folks who have some college and could be moved to a you know, full four-year degree attainment. Uh, but they have very different needs than um, students yeah. coming from the high school pipeline. So I'm just curious to know what work you've done in that area. A lot of our work in that area does kind of intersect with the vocational education mission of the community colleges where, because the average age of students in those programs is 30, um, they really are serving that working adult, you know, maybe working parent, um, stranded workers. And so that's um, right now where we've focused a lot of our work on those um, that po population group. I don't actually know how it factors into kind of the, the bachelor's degree work that we've done. It, it's so, I mean, it is the case, as you probably already know, the vast majority of students who graduate from UC and CSU and almost all, but not all, the private nonprofits are traditional age students. Um, but there is a, a growing number, uh, more so at CSU than at UC, of non traditional age students. But I think the, the main point of your question is there's a large untapped, and it's unknowable how easily tapped it might be or how hard, maybe the right thing is how hard it would be to tap uh, older students and make it financially and from a family perspective feasible for them to come back and finish their degree. I know some of the discussions about online offerings have included that group, so uh, something we, we're keeping our, our eye on, but. You know, we operate, we need good data to do our work, and right now there isn't a, a good data on, on that yet. Good afternoon, Mario Guerrero. I'm uh, with the California Faculty Association. I'm also adjunct faculty at Sacramento State. 
Um, I was wondering if you've taken a look at the um, students that both the CSU and the UC are turning away, roughly 30,000 in the CSU, and I forget how many thousands in the UCs, and how diverse that, those populations are. Because mm -hmm. what I see is that you know um, we're having um, uh, underrepresented groups um, uh, not graduate on time, and, and, and so how diverse are those groups that are being turned away, and also what the impact is to those populations that have been turned away. For example, if uh, someone is uh, um, uh, qualified to go into a, a CSU or a UC, but they're turned away due to funding, they may go to a community college or may, they may delay. They go to a community college, some community college students end up staying there for many more years than two. So have you taken a look at those populations to see what some of the problems may be, uh, again, also with diversity and, and delayed education, completion of education? Do you want to make the data point this time? <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, so so two things. That. First, if we had a statewide longitudinal student <laughs> database that spanned the systems and realized each system already has longitudinal data within their system, so what we and others have been advocating for is connecting those longitudinal systems so that then I could tell you how many of those students who applied for uh, UC and CSU and were turned away or were redirected, which is what's happening now rather than actually flat out uh, turned away. And by redirected, I mean you're redirected to a campus that you didn't apply to. Um, I would be able to tell you what happened to those students. I'd be able to tell you whether they showed up at a community college instead. Uh, I'd have some ability to tell you whether they ended up at a private nonprofit or whether they didn't even go to college. And so right now we don't, the, the, the short answer to your question is we don't really know. We do know that it's a lot harder for a student to make it through community college and transfer then to a four-year college. So it is the case, and we've argued this in a number of different reports and in this one as well, that if we expanded opportunities for uh, more slots for students at UC and CSU, and this happens not just with first-time freshman applicants, that's where the biggest numbers are, but it also happens with transfer applicants. Uh, CSU also identifies transfer applicants who were eligible but denied is the term they have, eligible but denied. Um, if we made more slots available for those students, almost certainly it would be the case that we would be serving, A, well, we would be serving more students, and B, uh, almost certainly they would represent, uh, have a greater diversity of underrepresented and low-income students than the regular student population. But again, without good data, we can't really tell you um, what those numbers and what those patterns are and what those students are actually doing. I will add one other thing we do know that the number of students leaving California to go to co college elsewhere continues to grow. It's, a, a, a sub, it's a, not a small number. It's in the many thousands, um, I think tens of thousands. I don't remember off the top of my head. And uh, the places that those students are increasingly going to are not private nonprofits in other states. They're going to public universities in other states, like the University of Arizona, Arizona State, the University of Oregon. I don't know if it's still the case, but it used to be the case that the University of Oregon had more recruiters here in California than they had in Oregon. Thank you for the research and sharing your findings today. Um, you answered my first question, which was going to be around a program study and that effect on wages. My other question harkens back to a prior PPIC report on regional attainment gaps. And I'm wondering how that layers into the conversation around wage premiums and earning potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's your work, so I'm, I'll let you answer. All right. So we have done some work looking at regional patterns, and it is the case that regions have uh, different pathways. So that um, we, we've done some work focusing on the San Joaquin Valley, uh, Los Angeles County, and the Inland Empire. Um, this, in the San Joaquin Valley, we see actually good high school graduation rates, better than the state average. College going rates are pretty good. Um, they are primarily to community colleges rather than to four-year colleges compared to the rest of the state. And then transfer um, from community colleges to four-year colleges is very low uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. And then in the Inland Empire, there are access both to community colleges and four-year colleges in terms of those going, college going rates is lower than in the rest of the state. Their high school graduation rates are also lower than in the rest of the state. And it's, there's a lot to unpack, right, in this kind of pathway from high school, and really it's pre-K if we want to go all the way back, uh, through and, and completing college. But we know these key transition points really matter, and in those regions, those are some of the key transition points. Los Angeles County uh, looks pretty good. 
uh, incredibly diverse population, but a very large community college and a very large four-year college network. Uh, so there's a lot of good news about what's happening in LA still, um, uh, equ important equity gaps that, that still need to be addressed. Thank you. Hi, my question is, uh, is there any data that you might have looked at that lets us know what happens to the uh, minority students who do not graduate for a four-year institution when it comes to their annual income or their debt uh, if they do not end up, end up graduating from one of our systems? So Including I don't know, Marisol, if you want to add in. This, that, they would be in our some college group. Yeah. But I don't think we did this breakdown. No. Did we do um, one thing that I would add is a few years ago, we wrote a report that is called the student debt and the value of college. Uh, she's, and, she's telling me you have to use the <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> A few years ago, we did a report that was called uh, Student Debt and the Value of College Education. And, and in that piece, here we're only kind of looking at the income and the revenue wages side without taking into account that many students have to take loans and all that. Uh, so a few years ago when we did that report, we find out that even for those students who take loans, uh, getting a college degree is worth it. The problem is for those, uh, and we really identify, like the worst case scenario is you going to a college, taking a loan and not graduating. That's the worst, that's even worse like if you just didn't pursue and just stay and, and find a job with a high school di uh, diploma. So um, if you want, um, feel free to look at that report where it like, just gives you a, kind of a picture of both the income and the cost side. I think the net is still is worth it to uh, getting a college education. I think that's kind of the main message of that report. I think we have just time for one more question, but we're happy to stay around afterwards. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm glad uh, longitudinal data has been mentioned a couple of times. I'm just wondering if PPRC is going to, or plan to collect such data in the future. <laughs> so we enter into agreements with um, segments of higher education and employment development department to access that data for the, um, to do this research and share with you. Um, and we've recently released a report as the author here is Jake here, on um, the statewide longitudinal data system. Um, so it's an area that we care deeply about, but um, I don't think we would be the institution that would need to house that data, but we certainly have expertise in how to use it and how to um, merge it when necessary. Um, so it's, it's an, an, an area that we're definitely engaged in. Okay, thank you all for coming. Please feel free to come up and have you have further questions.